Amen. I listened to a New York Times podcast called The Argument. The format is pretty rare these days. Three intelligent people with very different opinions who actually talk to each other. The Times columnists listen respectfully, debate forcefully, and they even seem to like each other. An episode or two helps to explain why some people thought democracy was a pretty good idea in the first place. It's called the argument, so most of the time they don't agree. In the first part of last week's show, the three reacted very differently to the prospect of a Bernie Sanders presidency. But then there was a surprising turn. Michelle Goldberg, who holds down the team's left flank, began by floating some ideas from a column she ultimately published yesterday with the title, The Darkness Where the Future Should Be. Goldberg spoke from the heart about feeling that our political system is deeply broken, that we have created environmental problems we will never be able to solve. There is a growing sense, she said, that progress has ground to a halt and that there is nothing great ahead of us. As she talked, you could hear David Leonhardt, who stands on the show's middle ground, grunting in agreement. He said he'd been wrong about technology holding the key to a bright new future. Now he can see it's just one more iPhone update after another and robots stealing your information or taking away your job. Ross Douthit, the resident conservative, said he just had to mention his new book, The Decadent Society. He's called it. The adjective here is technical. Douthat isn't just saying that our society is debaucherous or corrupt, but that it has fallen into institutional decay and cultural exhaustion while remaining prosperous and innovative enough to ward off panic. Decadence is a spiritual paralysis. Uh, loss of hope and meaning. Douthat traces it in the declining birth rate, the opiate crisis, the failure of so many young men to grow up, cynicism about institutions and ideals, and an endless run of superhero movies. There have been other decadent societies, of course, the Abbasid Caliph in the 13th, Caliphate in the 13th century, late Byzantium, the Austro-Hungarians before the First World War. But every story about decadent cultures winds up in Rome. Rome was a city of marble whose dominion ran to the edges of the known world, a military juggernaut at the forefront of technical advances. But centuries before it fell, Rome lost its purpose. In a muddle of scandal-ridden emperors, barbaric public spectacles, and second-rate poetry. Jesus' ministry unfolded in part of Rome's empire. Ranks of Roman troops marched through the streets. Imperial edicts were nailed up in town centers, and everyone grumbled about Rome's exorbitant taxes. Rome was not yet as decadent as it would become, but it was clearly on the way. First century Jews left behind few kind words about the local representatives of the imperial city who were generally cynical, greedy, and cruel, annoyed at being assigned an exotic posting among religious fanatics who didn't know how to have a good time. But not all Romans were like that. A religious revival swept across the empire just as the cultural exhaustion and cynicism was setting in. Spiritually serious Romans largely spurned the horror romance tales of their own mythology, but they were deeply fascinated by the ancient and sophisticated religious cultures of the people they had conquered. Many Romans, especially soldiers, joined mystery cults whose elaborate rites and rigorous morality were crafted from ancient Egyptian and Persian lore. 
but above all, they were drawn to the Jews. Judaism in the time of Jesus was growing rapidly, mostly through an influx of Gentiles looking for something transcendent in a world that had lost its way. Some, called proselytes, became full-fledged members of the religious community. Others, called the God-fearers, remained on the outskirts, attending synagogue and keeping some laws, but remaining Roman enough to pass in the wider society. Most first century synagogues that have been excavated by archeologists have inscriptions testifying to some generous gift or another made by these sons and daughters of decadent Rome who found something deeply compelling in Israel's God. In today's gospel, we meet a nameless centurion who must surely have been among them. He was a division commander of the Roman army, well paid, probably literate, a figure who, generally speaking, would be respected by his troops and feared by the locals. But God was already moving in his life. St. Luke's version of the story tells us that he had paid for the construction of the local synagogue. The centurion comes to Jesus and he asks that he heal his servant, even though Roman medical science was widely respected. Though he could have laid down a demand, the centurion approaches Jesus in deep faith and humility. He calls Jesus Lord, a term that confesses Jesus' singular authority and his own willing obedience. The centurion also believes that Jesus can heal from a distance, commanding the forces that afflict his servant to depart from his body. I am not worthy for you to come under my roof, he confesses. Before Jesus' perfect righteousness, he is deeply aware of his own sin and weakness. Jesus is deeply moved by this, and he declares that even in Israel, he has not seen such faith. And then Jesus describes men and women like this centurion, Gentiles from every corner of that faithless, heartless Roman Empire coming to share with Israel's great heroes in the glorious feast to come. The rest of the New Testament bears out the prophecy that Jesus pronounced that day. The book of Acts repeatedly notes how much success St. Paul found in preaching to the God-fearers he encountered in his mission work. They formed a significant part of most of the congregations addressed in the epistles. It was the predominantly Gentile church in Antioch where the disciples of Jesus were first called Christians. People like the centurion would eventually bring the faith back to their homelands as Christianity spread vigorously across an empire increasingly disenchanted with its old ways. Rome would fall, but the faith of the centurion lives on and thrives. And if we find ourselves in another decadent society, we should be encouraged as we proclaim and live the same faith. The message about Jesus resonates with the deep stirrings of the human heart across the ages, across cultures. The virtues we aim to practice in our life together, generous love, courage, patience, self-control, they bring true joy to human life. Our vision of a coming kingdom of justice and mercy is a true hope more lasting and profound than the shallow worldly promises whose weaknesses are now on full display. The truth, goodness, and beauty of the Christian message shine out in spite of the failings of those who would share it with the world. There will be challenges, of course. Many of those outside the church think they already know what we're about, and that we wouldn't have anything to offer people like them. We must rebuild trust after our message has been sullied by the failings of some of Christ's servants. 
and increasingly to share our faith will mean breaking with the surrounding culture, choosing to live by a different rhythm. Making new disciples will mean a different set of strategies for us. For more and more people in our community, it just won't work to appeal to a vague sense of guilt about not turning up on Sundays, failing to provide a respectable religious education for one's children, or falling behind in doing one's part. We will all need to be able to speak compellingly about the difference God makes in our lives, and our words and deeds will need to show that difference. People who struggle to find meaning in life, whose trust in all institutions has been badly shaken, aren't going to go in for gimmicks. But true holiness cannot be explained away or overlooked. When faith is awakened in the hearts of those who belong fully to the decadent society, it's often a truly marvelous thing. In all of the parishes where I have served, a large number of the most deeply generous and committed people were the converts. I believe that as Jesus told us, we will not see such faith in our own congregation as among those who have found Jesus after trying to survive without hope or meaning. <coughs> it may be harder for us to make disciples than it once was, but those disciples will likely inspire us deeply and encourage us to fuller commitment and authenticity in our own walk with Christ. If we live among people who see only darkness where the future should be, if God has called us to make disciples in the decadent society, this should not drive us to panic or despair. There are 10,000 centurions on our doorstep. If we can just introduce them to Jesus, it will be amazing to see what good things come to life. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. <clears throat>